Hello and welcome to Forward Boldly. I'm your host, Christine Niles. Today, I am going to give some reactions and input on a recent Catholic versus Protestant debate. It was hosted by Daily Wire host Candace Owens, whose husband, George Farmer, is a Catholic. And in this episode, she actually opens up about where she is on the faith. She herself is a Protestant, but because of conversations that she's had with her husband, uh, she is now considering the claims of Catholicism. So I wanted to encourage everyone out there, please pray for Candace, pray that she would indeed convert to the Catholic faith, to the fullness of the faith. I think she's been a very powerful voice for truth out there, and how much more powerful a voice would she be if she were, were brought into the fullness of the faith. So please pray for her. But I thought her husband did actually a very admirable job in defending the positions of the Catholic faith and various aspects of the Catholic faith. Clearly, this is a man who's intelligent. He has studied it. Uh, he went to Oxford, studied theology, studied patristics, which is interesting because that's exactly what I did. And it was actually studying patristics, early church history, the early church fathers. That was actually the first chink in my Protestant armor that helped lead me eventually to come back to the Catholic faith. I want to get into all of that very soon. But before we do so, I want to encourage all men out there, please consider coming to our Strength and Honor Men's Retreat. It's this August. Speakers will be Michael Voris, Simon Rafe, and Jesse Romero. And they are going to be talking about masculine faith. How do you live out your faith as a man, as a Catholic in this world? Uh, and so you're going to be hearing a message that you just very frequently do not hear, unfortunately, in this culture that has grown so effeminate, so feminized, and, and has so watered down the teachings of the faith. So again, that's in August. Simply go to our website, churchmilton.com, uh, strength-honor. That's churchmilton.com forward slash strength-honor. All righty. So I want to play an opening clip here where Candace talks a bit about where she is right now on her faith. I am attending Catholic church services more and more, obviously, because I bring my children uh, for celebrations at the cathedral and where my husband attends church. And the discussions have gotten interesting because my husband planted a seed in my head that won't go away. And I would not yet describe me as being in a place where that seed has fully bloomed. But it is a question that I am struggling with as somebody with Protestant beliefs. And what he essentially said to me, he was also uh, formerly Protestant, and now he's a Catholic, was, do I believe that in the 1,500 years following Jesus Christ, leading up to Martin Luther stapling his theses, that nobody went to heaven? So essentially, uh, Jesus saved us, and then for about 1,500 years, nobody went to heaven until Martin Luther stapled his theses and corrected things. I don't believe that. I struggle with that question, and it has been something that I have been sitting with for a very long time, of course, because that would almost imply in my mind that Martin Luther is the Savior and not Jesus. All right, so it's great to hear that Candace is actually attending Mass with her husband, and even though she's not actually receiving Holy Communion, she's still receiving graces from, from that Mass. Just being at the Mass, being the presence of our Lord in the Holy Eucharist, and being there with her husband, with her children, hearing the homilies. I hope that they're solid homilies. They probably are. Uh, she's receiving graces. So let's just keep praying for her that she continues to attend Catholic Mass and continues to have these fruitful discussions with her husband. I think she also brought up a very interesting point about the first 1,500 years of the church. This is something that I noticed as a Protestant myself. I was a Protestant for 11 years before I came back to the faith. And one thing that I noticed as a Protestant coming back to the faith, and this is not to knock Protestants in any way, because I know that there are some wonderful people. I met some really wonderful people of goodwill who I believe will make it to heaven sooner than, than some of the Catholics I know, because they were such good souls, truly authentically good souls. But many of these Protestants are deeply ignorant of the first 1,500 years of the church, deeply ignorant of it. It's almost like this idea of our Lord came on earth, gave us the gospel, and then leaves to heaven, and then 1,500 years pass of darkness, and then suddenly Martin Luther comes, and he saves the church, and he rescues it from the darkness and suspicion and paganism. 
of Catholicism, idolatry of Catholicism. And then you have John Calvin as well, you know, giving us a systematic theology in his institutes. And then, you know, and then so you have lots of history after the year 1500, but almost nothing, you know, in between that and then the founding of, of Christianity by Christ. And Cardinal John Henry Newman once said, to be, to be deep in history is to cease to be Protestant. And that's very true. I found that to be very true myself as I started studying the early church when I was at Oxford. Like I said, that's really what started the ball rolling to my eventual return to the Catholic faith some years later. Now, it would take a few years because I had to, you know, the, the myths and the biases that I had against the Catholic faith really had to be sort of torn down. Um, and also the distrust, distrust that I had towards the Catholic faith because of all these myths and lies being sold to me by people in authority whom I trusted, whom they themselves had been told that from the previous generations. And that's just been passed down from generation to generation to generation. A lot of Protestants of goodwill being sold these lies and believing them and trusting their pastors because they don't know any better. And you don't know what you don't know. And when you start reading the early church fathers, you start reading you know, how, how theology is developing. You start reading about the councils, how the councils were crucial in the development of dogma in the church, the formulation, the clarification of dogma, as well as formulating the canon of scripture, you know, on which Protestants pretty much base their entire faith, sola scriptura. When you start seeing how crucial these traditions were, the early church, the Catholics, the Catholic bishops, the Catholic clergy, how crucial they were to the formulation, the explanation, the, the, the confirmation of dogmas and doctrines of the faith, you can't help but start realizing that many of the truth claims of the Catholic faith are true. They're accurate. And a lot of Protestants are simply, they're unaware of this. They're ignorant of it because they're not taught it. They're not taught it and they just don't think about it. Now, I want to go ahead and, oh, something else that um, Candace talks about too, is, I mean, she's obvious about some of the struggles that she continues to have about the faith. She mentions the veneration of Mary. And that's something I understand because that also was an obstacle to my return to the faith. And I've read with other Protestant converts to the Catholic faith that Mary is very often the final obstacle to coming to the faith because Protestants have this mistaken notion that we place her on you know, an equal level to God, which Catholics do not do. That's blasphemy. No one is equal to God. Mary is a mere mortal. I would encourage those out there who are still questioning the role of Mary, maybe don't understand it very well, whether you're Protestant or Catholic, uh, please watch the May 5th episode of The Download. That was specifically uh, focused on Mary, and each of the four panelists bring up various aspects of Mary, theological, scriptural, historical, various things. And all together, it pr provides a very um, full picture of the role of Mary in salvation history. Um, I would encourage you, go and watch that if you have any questions. I think it, it, it does a good job of explaining various um, aspects of Marian theology and also does a good job of responding to some of the Protestant objections to the role of Mary. Now, I want to go ahead and play a clip that revolves around the question of sola scriptura, scripture alone, which, as we know, is one of the pillars, the two great pillars on which the reformers uh, built their faith, sola scriptura, sola fide, which is faith alone. But this one focuses mainly on sola scriptura. That everything a church leader says, whether it's a pastor, whether it's a priest, whether it's a pope, has to conform to what the Holy Spirit has already said through Scripture. So I don't believe that a pope or a priest or whatever can say something or a council can come together and declare something as doctrine that is not explicitly supported by Scripture. So I, would, I think that it goes back to authority, church authority versus scriptural authority. I mean, there's a lot to unpack. Yeah, there's, just, there's just, so much. Just to I kind of break that down, because I picked up about five different things which I can respond to. So even within Sola Scriptura, I would say that there's, there's a whole lot of different areas, because you also mentioned the Pope, and then there's papal infallibility, and that's a separate doctrine, etc. 
So, Sola Scriptura, where in the Bible does it say Sola Scriptura? Yes, well, the doctrine of Sola Scriptura, if you go back to why the Reformation happened, if you go back to Martin Luther's 95 Theses, which he didn't actually intend to spark some kind of revolution. That's why he wrote them in Latin, because he wanted them to be this academic debate and discussion among the professors at the University of Wittenberg. And it ended up kind of blowing up and starting this Reformation revolution in which he didn't, I don't think that he would have said necessarily sola scriptura, but his gripe was with, and I, it might seem like a roundabout way, but I am getting there. His gripe was with not just papal authority, but also the practice of indulgences, which is in very like crude terms, the idea that basically you can pay your way into heaven or you can pay souls out of purgatory. And well, basically... That, yeah. That's, yeah, yeah, yeah. Carry on. I, I, I want to I hear your Yeah, well, I mean, rebuttal, just to come but, back on the question, because I just want to be clear. Scripture itself does not say scripture. Yes. alone, right? That's the point. It does not say at any point in Scripture that Scripture alone is to be utilized as the sole basis for faith. All right, so Farmer makes a great point. He cuts to the very heart of the issue here. As I said, Sola Scriptura is one of the two great pillars on which the Reformed faith is founded, basically meaning that we can't judge any doctrines of the faith apart from scripture, that if it's not in scripture, if it doesn't have a scriptural basis, then it can't be true, basically. Well, what's interesting is the very concept of sola scriptura, scripture alone, is not founded in scripture. So there's this circular reasoning going on. Everything has to be judged by sola scriptura, except the very idea of sola scriptura, because there is nothing in the Bible that says scripture alone. And in fact, sola scriptura is not the way the church operated at all in its 2,000 years of history. I already touched on some of it before. Um, the first 400 years of the church, the canon of scripture was not even formulated until the end of the um, fourth century, 393. That's when you had the canon of scripture. And how was it formed? How was it finalized? It was through the, through, it was through the councils, the Catholic bishops meeting together, being guided by the Holy Spirit, and confirming which books were canonical and which were not. But for 400 years, the Christians didn't have a finalized canon of scripture. So they might've had a few letters or documents floating around here and there, but you know what else they had? You know how else the teachings of Christ were handed down to these various Christian communities? It was through oral tradition, tradition. Tradition was crucial in the passing on of the faith and the formulation of the faith, not just in the early church, but actually throughout the history of the church. We have the two pillars of inerrant scripture and capital T, tradition. And it's the tradition that the Protestants ignore. They think they can do away with it and they don't realize as, as they do away with tradition, they actually do away with the canon of scripture because the canon of scripture could not have been formulated and finalized without the tradition. So they're kind of, uh, they're, they're, it's like they're shooting themselves in, in the foot. They're removing. They, they think, you know, if I get rid of this, then this remains. Well, you don't understand. You're actually removing kind of the, the base on which this was formulated and the entire house crumbles. And, and what's can, what can be frustrating too is that a lot of Protestants have this sort of notion, maybe not explicit, but so this sort of notion like the Bible just dropped out of the sky from heaven in completed form, that it just sort of dropped out of the sky and, and there it is. And like I said, that's not how it worked. That's not how it worked. Didn't have a finalized canon of scripture for 400 years. Tradition was absolutely essential in that, finalizing the uh, final canon of scripture. All right, let's go ahead and play another clip where Farmer points out a double standard in the application of sola scriptura. But the irony of that argument, because you kind of have already linked it to the next point, which I was going to make, which is that you could argue that papal infallibility is not explicitly defined in Scripture in the same way that Scripture itself yes. is not defined in Scripture in the same way that Trinity, Trinity is not defined is in not Scripture. Defined. And as a result, you could say, OK, but you're using an argument selectively because you're saying it in this circumstance, it applies where Scripture alone must be the only argument. But on the flip side, where you're talking about papal infallibility, this, however, does not apply, even yes. though I could argue, which I will do that you could deduce 
from yeah. Scripture, that papal infallibility is actually defined in Scripture. So here, I think he makes a great point, and it's a point that Ali Beth Stuckey actually wasn't able to respond to. And it's that you're selectively applying sola scriptura. So, for instance, the papal infallibility. Oh, well, that's not in the Bible, so therefore it can't be true. Well, what else is not in the Bible? The Trinity is not in the Bible. There, there's no dogma of the Trinity in the Bible. How did we formulate this dogma of the Trinity, that, that God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? How did we formulate it? Again, tradition. It was tradition with a capital T, the ecumenical councils. How did we formulate the Nicene Creed that churches everywhere, Protestant and Catholic alike, recite on a regular basis? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. How do, how do we know this creed? Again, tradition, the councils, they came together, the bishops, the Catholic bishops, coming together, guided by the Holy Spirit, formulating this creed, formulating, explaining the dogma of the Trinity. And so th th these are just a handful of examples of basic teachings of Christianity that all Protestants, pretty much all Protestants, and you're and unless you're a total loony liberal, that Protestants agree with, and yet they're not necessarily based 100%, found 100% in scripture. They're formulated through tradition. Now let's turn to a segment where they discuss the canon of scripture and how that was formulated. When was the canon of scripture formed? The first example of the canon of scripture being formed was the Synod of Hippo, right, in 393. So by the end of the fourth century is when you have the mod modern canon of scripture defined, right? And then the Council of Carthages, uh, which were in the third, fourth, and fifth century, which then went on to define what we now term the canon of scripture. Well, actually, it was not even what we now term to define the canon of scripture because, of course, the Protestant Bible is without what the is called. The Apocrypha. Well, the Deuter yeah, Deuterocanonical books, the Apocrypha, is, as the Protestant church would call it, so, um, which the reformers themselves removed. So you're then arguing to say that for 1,500 years, you have a canon of scripture which has books in it which themselves are no longer considered canonical. Mm -hmm. And not even for 1,500 years, because as I said, the canon of scripture wasn't actually defined until the end of the fourth century. So you've actually got 1,200 years in which a selection of books that were then reformed by the reformers in the 16th century was used by the church. So on that basis, your arguments about Scripture and what forms the kind of scripture become the basis. And that's kind of where that was one of my first questions about mm -hmm. the Catholic Church and about Protestant scripture. Once again, great point. Who formulated the canon of scripture? Tradition was essential to doing that. It was the early church, the church fathers, the bishops getting together in councils led by the Holy Spirit, putting together the final canon of scripture. Before that, it was oral tradition handing these things down. And, and another thing that he brings up that's a great point, too, is we know that when Martin Luther came along, he decided on his own that there were certain uh, scriptural books that didn't belong in the Bible. So even though they'd been there for about 1,200 years and they were finalized by the church and agreed to by the church, Martin Luther came along on his own authority, by the way, his own authority, acting like the so-called dictator pope that he detested so much and threw out some, several of these books, threw them out. You know that he wanted to throw out the book of James? He called it a book of straw. He hated the book of James. He, if, if it were up to him, he would have thrown that out. He hated the book of Revelation. He wanted to throw that book out for various reasons. So um, <laughs> he acted exactly like the Pope that he detested so much. He made himself the arbiter you know, of, of truth, which is not what the Pope actually does, but in his mind, that's what he's claiming. He made himself the sole arbiter of what is true and what is false in the canon of scripture. And he decided on his own, I'm gonna throw these books out. Well, who the hell are you? Who the hell are you to determine 
which which books are part of the canon, which are not, based on your sole authority. And what I find so amazing is that Protestants don't question Luther on this. Many of them don't. don't. You know, they simply accept him on his word. Oh, he was right to throw those out because they're not scriptural. How do you know they're not scriptural? They were part of the canon of scripture 1,200 years. Now, suddenly you come along in the 1500s and you decide, oh, this is not scriptural. Well, how do you know that? What, what exactly, you know, led you to that belief? Oh, the Holy Spirit. Really? The Holy Spirit? So the Holy Spirit didn't lead the church for 1,500 years. It was only when you came along, Mr. Luther, the final arbiter of all authority, and it was only the Holy Spirit spoke solely through you, one man, in an authoritative way. Do you, have, do you have any idea how ridiculous that sounds? I'm not trying to be disrespectful to Protestants. As once again, I was a Protestant for 11 years. But think about that, please, for just a moment. Just think about it objectively, how ridiculous that sounds. He is given the sole authority to interpret the, the, the Holy Spirit's um, guidance to him with regard to the canon of scripture. And he throws out a bunch of books that were already part of the canon of scripture. I, I can't even imagine the hubris of any man doing that. But then millions of people after that, simply taking him at his word and not seeing the utter irony of this, that, you know, the objection to, oh, the Pope acts like a dictator. He just decides on his own what's true and what's not. First of all, that's not what, how it works. But, but then Luther acting in exactly the same way, and then Lutherans and later Protestants just blindly believing it and following him, it's completely, it makes no sense at all. It makes no objective sense. Let's go ahead and play another clip where really uh, the fundamental question is asked by Ali, the fundamental question. Let's go ahead and play that clip. How do we measure? How do we measure? Since Catholics say that they also believe in the Bible, you do believe that the Bible is an authority, is an important authority, Correct. and does shape the faith. Um, by what standard do we judge the teachings of a priest or the teachings of a pope? Um, because I think you would agree that with the current Pope, not everything that he says is in alignment with the Christian faith. So if he says something about climate change or homosexuality or whatever he's got to say that you know, you know, is not correct, by what standard are you judging? So she asks, by what authority? By what authority do you judge the words and actions of the Pope? By what authority do you judge the words and actions of any clergy or really any Catholic? By what authority? That, more than any other single question about the Catholic faith, is fundamental. You have to first talk about authority before you can really talk about anything else. Communion of saints or Mary or anything like that. By what authority? There's a wonderful book of historical fiction written by Father Robert Hugh Benson titled By What Authority? And it goes into that. It talks, you know, it's, it's, it's set in Reformation uh, England. And it's, it's historical. It's wonderful. He has a wonderful series of books of historical fiction. If you have any interest in that time period of Reformation uh, England and the Catholics and the Protestants and the persecution, all of that, um, I recommend that you go read his series of books on that. But By What Authority? It's very important, as I noted in one of my previous episodes titled Francis Fatigue, that the doctrine of papal infallibility, it, it's greatly misunderstood among Protestants. They think, as I mentioned before, that the Pope just gets up there and acts like a dictator and decides, you know, if he wakes up one day, oh, I'm going to define this as a new dogma of the church. And then he wakes up the next morning and says, no, no, no I'm going to find this instead, um, as if he has this sort of arbitrary dictatorial authority. He does not. He does not have that authority. And infallibility is actually very narrowly defined. And there are really two ways of understanding infallibility. One is when the Pope pronounces things ex cathedra, from the chair, meaning from the chair of Peter, from his sacred office officially. I declare, I define, I proclaim. Very rarely have those 
utterances been issued by the Pope. They've been issued only a handful of times, and they've concerned things like, for instance, the dogma of the Immaculate Conception, things like that, or of the Assumption. The Pope is explicitly stating through a formula, this is the dogma of the church. And the dogma hasn't just dropped from the sky, uh, you know, that day. It's, it's really just a, a clarification of something that the church has always believed. But this is now the official proclamation of it. But it's something that the church has always believed. For instance, the Assumption of Mary. Catholics have always believed in the Assumption of Mary. It just wasn't formalized until that dogmatic proclamation. The second type of infallibility is when the church talks about doctrines of the church that have always been taught in union with the bishops of the world from the beginning of the church. So for instance, abortion. Abortion has always been taught as intrinsically evil. Now, is there some infallible dogmatic proclamation about abortion? Of course there isn't. But the church has always taught this through its 2,000 years of history. Popes have always taught it. It's been part of the teaching of the church. The bishops in union, bishops in union with the pope have always taught it. And so in that sense, you also have infallible doctrines of the church. So those are the two ways in which, um, in which we have infallibility, papal infallibility. By what authority? That's a question really that, that, ca- that Protestants need to ask themselves. Because once you take away the magisterium, okay, which is the teaching authority of the church, once you take that away, as you know, you have doctrinal anarchy. All you have to do is look at the many, 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 many different Protestant sects and denominations to know that there's doctrinal anarchy. I mean, I myself went through multiple different denominations, depending on how my theology changed. So I started out as a very hardcore Calvinist, five-point tulip, all of that. Um, And then I started softening on it, started thinking, okay, well, maybe this isn't quite right. And I did some more reading. So then at one point I became Lutheran. But then I did some more reading. I thought, oh, I'm not sure I agree with this. You know, let's go to Methodism. Um, Now, no, non-denominational. You have so many of these different Protestant sects and denominations, many of them teaching lots of different things. Some disagree on divorce and remarriage. Some disagree on the issue of abortion. Um, You know, lots and lots of different uh, disagreements on on some sometimes fundamental things about the faith. So again, it's by what authority you have to be able to answer that question. You have to answer that question. I hope you're enjoying the show. The rest of the show is behind the paywall, so please go to churchmilton.com to watch the rest. For those who are not premium subscribers, you can sign up at churchmilton.com forward slash go premium. See you there.